Hey everyone, it's Alan over at Cobblers Plus, and today we have a bit of a treat. We're going to be working on a pair of Edward Green boots. So come join us and check out what we're going to be doing with them today. I'm Alan Trushkov. Join us today and enter our world of a cobbler to see the craftsmanship it takes to rebuild and restore footwear and other leather goods, as well as recommendations from our industry. So today on these boots, we're gonna be resoling them with a new set of day-night soles, as well as we're gonna be doing a little work on the uppers here, and Joe and I are still gonna be talking over a little bit more about the details on what it is he wants to get done. But regardless, we're still gonna give them the full treatment on these uppers here. Now I'm excited because Edward Green's here in our state in Colorado is not a very common brand that we see here um, so it's it's a nice treat every now and then to get a pair of nice boots or shoes in like this to work on and I definitely have to take out the laces out of these guys because they are a little bit on the longer side so during the process of when we're going to be trimming and sanding everything I don't want to have it get caught up a lot of times with a taller boot if it's got full eyelets going through all the way through the top we can leave the laces in but anyways we're still going to be cleaning everything because they they could definitely use a little bit of loving in them so but we'll go ahead and get started up on these let's see where'd it go there it went I'm just put a little bit of thinner for the glue now this thinner that i'm using it's of course specially formulated for adhesives not so much the upper or anything so it doesn't really do much for the dye on it for the original dye pigment but still I try to get little to none on that upper okay yeah, he's definitely definitely worn those down a fair amount Perfect. I'm running out of this uh, thinner here, so might not be enough for these boots. Yep, I have to go ahead and get that refilled. Either way, I have to let them sit for just a just a minute to deactivate the glues so that I can cut through everything better. But I'll see you just back here in a second. All right, so we've allowed the uh, thinner to kind of settle in and deactivate the glues there. So now we can go ahead and start turning everything down. Kind of surprising though that uh, these day-night heels aren't nailed in. They're just glued on. I mean, they're glued on very well, as you can tell. I'm putting a little bit more effort into there, but you can see that these day-nights they usually have holes here, and these holes are intended so you can put gripper nails in there. They kind of secure things a little bit more, and preventing the nails from sticking up too high where they can potentially scratch any kind of hardwood flooring or anything like that. So just kind of an interesting one there. I can go ahead and pry off this heel base here. And this heel base from the side and from this top so far, it is looking like it's an all leather one, of course, which is Definitely a nice thing. And it is definitely kind of expected for a nice boot like this to have a leather stacked heel base. One reason why I mentioned that is there are some nicer high end brands out there too that also tend to use leather stacked heel bases, and then there are some who actually use what's called a composite which is basically just not composite uh, fiberboard it's basically pressed paper pretty much I mean, it's very durable stuff compared to say an all rubber molded heel or something but you know it's uh, kind of upsetting when some of the companies decide to cut corners in such a such a manner it's a good thing these guys aren't one of those companies 
Man, that thing, I wonder what kind of glue they're using. Oh, they're using, it's the same equivalent to what us cobblers tend to use. It's very strong. Okay, guess I'm gonna have to bring in the pliers. Yeah, that that leather there is starting to get a little old and it looks like it's kind of dried out there. So I'm debating on if I should end up replacing that heel base or not. Because usually our goal is to try to save at least certain original parts, like the heel bases or some of you may know it as the heel block on there. But considering how this thing is all ripping and coming apart on me right now, I think it might be a safer bet just to get it ripped replaced completely swing, swing around there sorry about the squeakiness but you can see there that it's ripping so i mean i could fix it up at this point too but why not you know replace those uh heel blocks make them nice and fresh I'm sure this gentleman will definitely appreciate that on his Edward Greens. I do have to hang on to those anyways, regardless though, because I do need to measure out the thickness. And the other thing is that these do have one side that is just a tiny fraction thicker than the other. So this section here, which is just a little bit thicker, is um, it, it goes on the inside right here and that kind of gives it a little bit more of an arch support feature on the on the shoe itself so well, I don't really need to take that little chunk off this whole sole's coming off anyways so all right got that now we're gonna move on to our blade here and start cutting in and luckily these are mid soled on so they have a leather at least I'm assuming that's a leather one. Sometimes, again, companies don't do the leather, but that gives you an idea of what it looks like. We've got the welt there. As you can tell at the top, and that's what the sole gets stitched to. And then right below that, we've got the leather midsole. And then finally, we've got the day-night sole underneath that. And because these are Goodyear welted, that means that these are stitched to the welt. So we have to be able to cut through those stitches all the way around to separate everything. And those of you who have, who have watched some of my other videos, yes, I am sitting down. Usually I do a lot of things standing up, but it's a busy time of the year for us and it has been hectic every single week for the last two months I've been having some kind of random thing pop up on me and when I tell customers I apologize this happened or this happened I'm starting to actually start feel myself like I'm the one that's just making up excuses or something as to why we're behind on the workload in reality that's that's the truth uh, this week I had my tire go out had to deal with that lost a little more than half a day worth of work because of that having to take care of that issue last week i had something else the week before that and so on it's my luck always right when the busy season starts everything else goes kind of nutty in other words so to anyone who's boots or shoes I'm working on during the busy season, I do apologize. It's just the way it turns out for me all the time. But you guys don't want to hear about that too much. Almost got it. I think you know what might, might be interesting. I'm going to actually leave this sole here intact and just cut it all off with the heel base itself. I'm just gonna hang on to that one. Never know for what, but just be an interesting one. Now, 
This is kind of interesting though for me. Because these are actually not full 360 degree welds. And I'll show you guys that once I get this sole off. But they are stitched as such. For that I need a little more leverage so I do have to stand up. not going to come off right. Alright, there we go. Ouch! Just got stabbed by the nail. So, a bunch of little nails and one of them just got me in the finger underneath there. Just one or two stubborn ones back here. There we go. Whew. Yeah, that was one of those little little nails there. Yeah, so it got me pretty pretty all right, I guess. Luckily, I'm not bleeding all over the place. Otherwise, I'd have to stop and throw a Band-Aid on and just so I make sure I don't bleed all over the boots here. But anyways, this will give you an idea there. As you can tell, it really got pulled up. Anyways, I have to pull a lot of that up to clean it up. But this is where the welt is right here. And it stops right here. And this is what's called the heel ren. And that's usually just a piece that gets glued into place. But it's kind of funny to me because they actually stitched it through like a Goodyear welted shoe that's 360 degrees, which means it goes all the way around Goodyear welted, where these are not and they still stitched it. Kind of interesting. I guess to keep it kind of uniform looking and everything, so. Right, but at this point, I'll go ahead and start pulling out all this cork here and everything. Uh, start fixing up this back end here a little bit, because I do have to either way get underneath here and take out a lot of that cork and everything. And we try to keep the heel run in position for as long as we can. And then finally, if we have to, we take it out and clean it up and then put it back into place just because it's positioned just right. We don't want to end up having any kind of changes done. I mean, even if we take it out, usually there's enough markings left over that we can, um, we can easily put it back into place. Sometimes if it's a well-worn boot or shoe, then that's a different story. But uh, watch this under here and carefully remove this piece here. And this is our shank. This is a wooden shank, of course. So looks like it's completely intact. Just needs to be kind of cleaned up. Get some of that old cork off of there. And maybe some of you guys can see it, but there's a little bit of green in the cork. And I don't think, yeah, that's not, uh, that's not mold or anything. So don't... Don't freak out. It's not. It's actually the, the glue that they used because I see some of it in certain areas. And again, the glues, they have um, solvents in them usually. And so having mold starting up in these areas here is very difficult because solvents, even after they evaporate, there's still residue left over of a hint that that was a solvent and mold will not grow in something like that. If anything, it will grow in areas that are furthest away from the solvent. So, but anyways, thought I'd show you guys that real quick. So I'll go ahead and clean out all the cork inside here because we, of course, will be replacing it. That cork absorbs, absorbs a lot of sweat and moisture, and so it does need to be replaced um, after a period of time. And then I'll go ahead and take apart this one and see what I can do with uh, trying to keep that sole intact for as long as possible. So I'll see you back in just a little bit. All right, so I've got the other sole off already. I was able to save that one. The only reason why I wanted to save it was in our cobbler community worldwide. We kind of like to do this little show off, I guess you can say. So thought I'd save it just for that in particular. 
But uh, I've got the cork out uh, out of this one here. I've got uh, both shanks, both heel runs out. I did mark them uh, left and right, even though these uh, wood shanks are pretty much identical. Um, I, I still prefer to have them back into the place that they were originally supposed to be in. Luckily, we don't have to replace those. We try to keep the original shanks as much as possible. Otherwise, uh, the replacement ones that usually uh, we're able to put in are steel. And some people don't like the steel ones, but unfortunately, if your shank is destroyed, kind of no other choice. That's the only thing that will hold up at that point. And then the heel runs here, I'm going to be taking out all these staples and just replacing them with... Uh, what's called a clinch nail anyways which you guys will see a little bit later on that and that helps me also be able to take out the old stitching i started here on the very corner right there and because i can't run this through our machine to pull out the old stitches and leaving them behind is a horrible thing to do it's very bad habit so i know a few cobblers that do that and you don't leave old stitches behind. Now out of the welt area, once I get everything kind of sanded out here a little bit more and kind of rough this bottom up better for the adhesion for that cork to fill in better, um, we'll be using our machine to pull the old stitches out and then any leftovers will pull out by hand. So I'll go ahead and uh, get everything sanded up and I'll see you guys back here in just a little bit. All right, so we've got everything sanded out. Had the old stitches all pulled out everywhere. And now I've got the cork up here all glued up. I did stick the shank back in and everything. I did also, before I really put anything back together, want to kind of give you guys a closer look and explain how everything on a Goodyear welted shoe or boot is assembled usually. So the shoe or boot starts out with a last, kind of like this one here, but it starts out as either wood or plastic. And then they attach this here. This is the kind of core of the footwear in other words um it's your leather insole that, that goes way down in here well there is an insole over top but way down in there you can see that lighter color that's that uh leather midsole insole piece uh, basically has a few thoughts on it well a few a few names on it basically um some people call it midsole some call it insole but it's basically the whole base construction of that footwear there you start out with that and then you start uh, building the upper off of that basically once you've got the upper all constructed it's stretched over to the last and everything then this little rib here which is basically a felt kind of like a cotton type material that gets glued in and so once you've got all the leather and everything wrapped sticking up here you get this uh, get it cut off to a certain portion point about maybe yay high roughly. So maybe about a, you know, between a quarter inch to about an inch will stick up. Um, just depends on everyone's machines differently. And then afterwards, this uh, Goodyear welt gets stitched onto that directly. And after the Goodyear welt is stitched on by machine, it you fill it in with cork because you have that crevice and that gap here to make sure it's all flush. And then you start putting on the sole like we are today. But that kind of gives you an idea of how everything is put together. So all these lines here, if I get this thing back off, all these lines here that you see, you've got, there's the rib material there, there is the liner, there is the upper right there, and here is the welt. Sometimes there may be a little, well, this one has an extra piece right where the toe area is, right about there. That's where the toe counter that keeps that nice firmer shape is as well. So right from about here forward that's where your toe counter piece you can see right through the white basically but uh, that's kind of how those are constructed usually and um, with a Goodyear welted machine um, you know you can see down in you can see up here there's some of that stitching a little bit visible and it comes in right there you can see some of that stitching on in that section so with us, we don't recommend replacing that welt, um, at least not often necessarily, only when needed. Uh, mainly because with a Goodyear welted machine, for example, you don't see those, um, those holes there left by the old thread. And so because of that, unfortunately on a machine, when you're going around, you are creating more holes. And um, 
that's not a good thing. Basically, that upper is going to be worn down quicker than expected. And so your limitation on how, often, how many times these can be resold is drastically shortened. Um, you know, for us, though, if we were replacing this welt, we do it by hand. So it converts from a Goodyear welted boot to a hand welted because we literally take an all like this and we go through each individual section right where each hole is and stitch on a new one and we always uh, aim for the original holes because we can see it better and because we're going at a bit of a slower pace than a machine would of course so that kind of gives you the idea of you know why we're not tearing off this welt and everything it's it's an extra um cost if we have to replace the welt because it is going to be also upgraded at the same time a machine may have a minor error unfortunately um, maybe a stitch was skipped or something like that but hand welted it's done by hand at a slower pace so it's impossible for us to really screw it up bad enough where we can't fix it or catch it in time we're on a machine it's it's running so that kind of gives you that idea there now we're gonna go ahead and uh, lay this cork. We don't use hot cork also. Um, we are of course a cobbler shop. Cobbler shops don't get what's called the hot cork machine. Some of you may know it, some of you don't. Hot cork machine basically squeezes mo uh, melted cork uh, from a block and melts it down to goo basically and it just fills in this crevice and you have to have something fill it in otherwise you will feel that ridge there significantly and cork is perfect for that. Now at the factories, they usually use the hot cork method because they are mass producing and it's worth it for them to have that machinery. For cobbler shops, not so much. So we get these pre-cuts either in sheets or other pieces. This one came out of a sheet, as you can tell there. And uh, we end up gluing it in. Now cork is cork, so there is no major difference. The one key difference though, between using the hot cork and this, this has a predetermined density already and thickness as well where with the hot cork it's placed in there they take a hot iron and they kind of even it out and everything one of the problems we've been hearing lately is that some people say with certain other brands i haven't heard too much from um from these guys or anything but certain other brands i've heard the complaint of person has multiple styles or shoes from this particular brand and um and all of a sudden they get a brand new pair and these feel hard they just feel like they're walking directly on concrete well that occurs when they take those irons and they accidentally put too much cork in there and instead of wiping it all off they really start pressing it in there and then finally wipe off some of the axis and it really compresses that cork heavily um, and it doesn't have enough time to re-expand and then get sanded out or anything because the sole gets placed on top sooner um, sooner than you would need it to and so everything gets really compacted in there where cork it does need uh, air pockets to function properly now again like i had mentioned with the cork it is designed to fill in that crevice but it also works as insulation um, it works to help uh, wick away moisture. It's a little more breathable as well. And as a great support feature, once this cork molds to your foot here, it acts as pretty much having a custom orthotic in your shoe. Some companies and some cobblers also use uh, felt cork pieces or um, uh, foam ones as well. Now those will be more durable overall, but the problem is that again, it is a synthetic material that is not very breathable. And once it goes, it, it really goes. I mean, it goes bad. Where with cork, it, it gradually starts to maybe degrade or absorbs moisture after countless times of wearing and starts to fall apart. Now, you usually don't feel that so much anyways, but with the felt ones and the, co felt ones and the um, foam ones, you definitely are gonna feel that a lot more because they just collapse completely so you know that's uh one of the reasons why we don't even stock the the felt or the foam ones but i'm just gonna go around and hammer everything in
And then here I'm using actually what's called the French hammer. You can see it's got that kind of uh, tail end right there. And this allows us to really kind of push into some of these gaps to get everything evened out nicely. Sorry, our comp air compressor came on. But uh, sometimes if you got like a hole in the bottom of the foot right here, they'll just kind of maybe sand out that section a little bit and then place a chunk of cork in like that there and fill it all back in and everything, which is fine for for us though. I'm, I'm kind of against it personally. Um, Again, because your foot perspires, even though you've got that leather there that's kind of in between your foot and the cork, the problem is still that it your foot sweats enough that uh, that moisture is going to start to go downward. It's not going to rise up. It's going to kind of go down a little bit more, and the cork is going to absorb it. Now, again, it's going to try to wick it away, but after a period of time, that cork starts to give out those uh, features that it naturally has, and uh, you have to repra replace it. So, you know, that's why we always replace it. But anyways, at this point, I'll go ahead and fill, out this, fill in this other one here. I'm going to go ahead and sand all this out so it's all flush. Reattach the heel run here. I already took out the old uh, staples and everything. And then start uh, gluing it up. We're, well, we're putting on the midsole first. I'll let you guys check that out, what it looks like. It's just a leather midsole. The original soles, which is perfect that I have this, had that uh, leather one right there. You can maybe see that line kind of faint there. But um, that goes on first, kind of as a buffer, and then goes on the day-night sole. So I'll go ahead and continue on, and we'll see you back in just a little bit. Actually, when I'm putting on the heel run, I'll let you guys check that out, what it looks like uh, when, when I start nailing it. And I'll show you the type of nails that I'll be using on there instead of the staples. So I'll see you back in just a little bit. All right, so I've got the heel run glued on here now. Now I'm going to go ahead and nail it in, and I'm going to use these nails here. These are what are called brass clinch nails. They are, of course, as you can tell, a bit longer. So what they're designed to do is once they go in, they hit the steel last right here. That's why it's so beaten up, as you can tell. And they turn into a hook, basically, and um, really secure that heel run because these heel bases that we're going to be putting on, this was one of the old ones there, as you can tell, they are nailed in through the top here. So if you have uh, a boot jack or if you have a habit of stepping on the back of your heel here to kind of take off your boot, if um, if there's no way of securing that heel run as a precaution, um, over top of also securing the sole and the heel block as well, then there's a high chance of you just tearing that off because it's not secured any other way, basically. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. I did take out the uh, three quarter length insole as well as the Spenko cushion this gentleman had in there too. So I took all that out. Now we're gonna make sure that, uh, sorry, I had a nail there. We gotta make sure that there is uh, no issues with the nails basically sticking through that insole because the insole is there to cover up the nails and protect your foot in other words because there are nails also holding everything down underneath right here and that's underneath the heel ring over top of that so those insoles are very important to have in there even though they're just a three-quarter length but you don't really need a full length one in here And this is definitely a lot more secure than the staples that they had in here. The staples, they're pretty much temporary, in other words, where this is going to definitely secure it a lot better. I mean, this thing ain't coming off. I mean, you got to use the pliers again to pull them off. Hope you guys are enjoying the videos. If you're somebody that's uh, been watching quite a few of my videos, 
I just figured out how to do the, well, read the analytics and stuff. And it turns out there's quite a few people that are watching my videos but aren't subscribed. So if you've been enjoying my videos, please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell to be notified when I got new videos coming out as well. But, um, you know, it's uh, it's been enjoyable. I just started, what, like four months ago, something like that, um, doing the videos. And I've definitely been enjoying it quite a bit. It does definitely take quite a bit more time to do the videos. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, in, in real time, we're working on multiple pairs, which I am working on multiple pairs right now. But I'm not showing all those details and everything. And if... Uh, if it wasn't the video that I was recording right now, I'd actually uh, be a little further on in the project on these ones as well. But, you know, like I said, it's uh, it's definitely something I've been enjoying. And I've, I've had a few of you come over, well, come to me and say that you guys have watched my videos and it kind of helped you understand and realize, you know, what a quality shoe is. You know, that's, you know buying something that's good or welted even blake stitch too is a huge upgrade from something you may be used to as far as say a molded sole or you know even just a regular adhered leather sole too so definitely definitely happy that's been helping out quite a few of you because that's been my goal basically all right but gotta make sure clean out that inside it's gets all that lint in there I don't want to be nailing down the lint but at this point now they do a great job of lining these up here actually between the wren and the welt here so make sure to try to get that lined up the exact same way as what they did also a little bit of tap there we go. That's how we go from, you know, no Ren to having the Ren on here finally. So at this point, everything's all glued up. Oh, and if any of you are wondering, the shank is kind of coming through. We definitely have to make sure we sand it out so it's a little more on the flush side everywhere here. Um, even that little spot there so that everything sits flush. The shank won't be poking through to, you know, agitate the foot at all and it won't be sticking out where when we start attaching the heel base back on it's going to be bulging out in any kind of funny way so that is something that's very normal when you still see a little bit of shank and it's not completely covered by the cork unless it's you know some of those shoes out there that have a much uh, much deeper uh, cavity basically then those need a lot more cork to fill up and they definitely get covered up where these are a little more on the low profile side of things and so the shank is going to kind of going to poke through and that's normal i mean i've got uh well if i grab them here we've got some allen edmonds here as you can tell there's definitely a lot more of the shank showing and you know that's uh it's a very normal thing to have you probably saw some of that shank poking through when i took everything off that was without the cork even coming off of this back area here is still fairly intact but anyways before i keep talking too much i'm gonna go ahead and nail this guy down get everything glued up got our leather midsoles right here that we're going to be putting on i gotta sand these up a little bit more to get them just a little bit rougher and we'll continue on so we'll see you in a little bit all right so i'm back here again i just took out this midsole out of the oven and we're gonna go ahead and glue everything together now it is the end of well not just the end of the day it's already after hours here at our shop i've been so busy and everything that i ended up getting held up here a little bit so i'm gonna go ahead and uh, stick this midsole together and uh, press everything out uh, and just let it cure overnight and then tomorrow we'll come in sand it all out and then start getting going on that day night sole hammer it a little bit now if anybody is curious about the press i'll uh, show that when we're doing the day night sole so i'm going to go ahead and just stick everything together um 
once we got that day night sold more going I'll let you guys check out what the press looks like and everything and how we do the welt press and all that kind of stuff but uh for today i'm done i'm beat it's time for me to go home and eat some dinner finally and relax a little bit uh, before another long day tomorrow so we'll see you guys later it'll probably be just a couple of seconds for you but for me it'll be tomorrow so we'll see you later all right so i've got the midsole all trimmed out and everything so it's as flush as possible and now it's time to go ahead and get the day night sole on back on there and we always want to try to make sure we're centering it as much as possible because we got the pegs there of course and the little day night logo Ooh, and i just pulled this thing out of the oven so it's it's a little warm we like to stick them in the oven to kind of help uh activate that uh, rubber cement a little better there or the contact cement sorry makes that day night sole a little more flexible too so that it binds to everything nicely so i've got everything hammered out but now i'm gonna move over to the press and I'll let you guys see what that looks like all right so we're over at our press now go ahead and stick this on so right now this is what we have as an attachment for just the heel area and we like to use this to press out the heel and after the heel goes from the heel to about the ball of the foot and then from the ball of the foot to the toe and our press is designed to do this sorry it's a little noisy but it's designed to do this and we prefer it this way over some of the other types of presses that are out there where they do the entire shoe all at once this allows any of the bubbles that may be still inside there to kind of squeeze their way forward all the way out through the toe because air pockets and bubbles are just not good to have basically in that that's a weak spot in other words when you got uh bubbles and air pockets and I've, I've got these uh wedge pieces right here that i put underneath this kind of helps distribute the pressure a little bit better because of course the boot is not completely flat so we have to make sure that it's all angled even though the foot last here this is for the other foot is slightly curved but we still want a little more pressure in certain areas there We don't really need long on the press. It's again contact cement, so basically everything is all stuck together. Now we're gonna move on to our five and one, and I'll let you guys see how we end up pressing the whole well area down and uh, cut off all this axis that's sticking out. So I'll meet you over at that area there. So we're over here at what's called our five and one. It's a bench top machine. In other words, that's hand operated, and. Uh, does a few different features what we're going to be using right now is called the welt press it's got this little section here that presses down the welt area and then down here we have our cutting piece which will cut off all that access so start out by running through the welt here go ahead and start cutting now again because this is rubber it doesn't clearly clearly cut it off completely so I end up uh, having to grab my hooked razor blade here and just cut off a little bit of that uh, extra little bit usually the five and one here it cuts a lot better through leather but uh, rubber has a tendency to be very stretchy and doesn't want to be cut the same way as the leather would on the five and one 
But there we go. Got a lot of that access off there. And you can tell there, and there's, of course, a little odd shape there because we didn't cut off that little bit there on the toe. That'll be sanded off. Now, at this point, I have to allow these to cure for a little while. Um, and it is, again, the end of the day. It's been very, very busy. So I'm going to let these cure again overnight. And I'll be back over here to finally work on that heel base. Uh, it's uh, that time of year for us where we're really busy. So everything's kind of crazy. But uh, we'll see you back here a little later then. All right, so we're back here again. We're over at our stitch room. We've allowed everything to cure nicely. Got it all sanded out a little more flushed and everything and marked up where the heel base is going to be going there. Now we're over here at the curved needle machine in our patch room. This is what we call it, the curved needle machine because it's got a nice curved needle like that but it's an outsole stitcher, so it's uh, designed to stitch that Goodyear welt all the way around. And we're gonna go ahead and get stitched up, matched up the thread on there, both brown and brown for top and bottom threads. And of course it gets stitched upside down. So we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna spray this down. This helps lubricate it a little bit so that when it's sliding across, it doesn't get stuck on us or anything. And of course we're going to stitch all the way around because it did have the um, the wren on the back also stitched up. So we'll go ahead and do that as well right now. Make sure it's all good there. Stop and clip this. pretty good you can see how tight that stitching is all the way around definitely not your average Goodyear welted shoe or boot where it's got a much wider stitch and that's what really sets apart the um, sorry I don't know if it's even in frame there definitely sets it apart quite a bit from the lower grade shoes and boots out there so that's definitely kind of nice there. Now, as you can tell, this stitch is sitting a little bit more in a channel um, because our machine here has a bit of a blade. So it does a small little cut right in there. So the stitch sets in a little bit deeper. It's protected for a longer period of time in such a manner. Um, there are a few spots where it kind of goes like that. So we're going to have to get in there with our little awl and just kind of push it through because rubber it likes to stretch so during the process at certain spots and points of the um, stitching it likes to grab hold of that rubber so we got to kind of realign the uh, rubber with the stitch so it's normal it's it's very uh, hard to do because we're basically having to line up three different things all at once so the uh, the blade that cuts the small channel the all that comes up from the bottom and then the needle that comes down from the top and it all has to simultaneously line up while it's uh, looping all the thread around and everything so it's a very challenging thing that's why a lot of shoe brands and boot brands from companies originally they actually don't even have a little blade on here for their rubber soles like day night here 
because it's it's a little it's a little harder to do basically but uh, we like to have it sitting in in the channel as much as possible that protects it for a longer period of time but i'll go ahead and set this one aside do the other boot um, clean off all the water and everything of course that's still lurking about and then uh, fix up some of those stitches and start gluing up that heel base there so we'll see you guys back in just a little bit all right all right so i'm back here again i've got the first layer of the heel base on and i've got it send it out to fair amount where i'm going to be able to level everything out properly because of course heel bases aren't original i've got one of the original ones here to go off of but again it was kind of rotting and everything already so i just thought it'd be a better idea to replace them now with heel bases we could either get pre-made ones i'll show you real quick Kind of like these ones these are stacked pre-made ones um now they fit certain types of shoes i guess you can say not all we've got some that are designed for like western boots and everything too but i only use them in certain occasions i guess you can say when we've got a when we've got a shoe like this i'd much rather build my own from scratch and i end up layering it that way everything kind of hugs down properly around that uh base area there all nice and everything so, oh, sorry, phone was thinking I was saying something. Sorry, I had to stick it there on the press. Now, of course, I heat these up just a little bit to make them somewhat more pliable. And as you can tell, the shapes are a little funny, not quite like that, because we cut them out of sheets of leather and everything. So, I had a few pieces left that were kind of smaller already so i just kind of chopped them in half and was able to use them for these ones here but uh, that's basically how it goes there all right so we've got that all pressed out i'm still going to go through on our five and one and kind of press down the little gap areas here and Make sure everything binds nicely around the corners. Don't want any kind of small gapage left. Just like that there. Go ahead and cut off the access here. It's been another one of those busy days for me and I've been holding off way too much on these boots. And I'm, uh, at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and let everything cure overnight on that heel base. But while I have them here, course I can't find it now I gotta get a set of shoe trees to sit to stick in here in just a second let me grab those all right I had to grab my shoe trees to put in here and everything and um, blow off a little bit a little bit of that excess dust but anyways I've got my uh, bottle here with uh, vinegar and desalter mixture which is a nice light cleaner basically and we're gonna go ahead and spray down everything and mainly what we're trying to clean is the suede, but I would much rather get the entire boot all wet. To make sure it deactivates any kind of salts that may be built up or anything. I also add a little bit of... Um, what's called easy cleaner in here too. It's a solvent free cleaning agent basically. Also used for suede and new box very well. And this will help us kind of get that suede going on these. So they do have a few little dirty spots there. Now we might not be able to get everything out get whatever we can with this first go around looks like as you can tell there's some lighter spots and everything that's actually most likely because there was some form of wax there on the toe and so it's not allowing this to penetrate quite as easily oh we'll get to it eventually but it's one of the key reasons why if you're ever shining shoes if you use just a cream that's great the creams, though, are usually designated for as a polish to restore more of the color and some of the nutrients back into the leather. 
there's a higher concentration of dye pigment in the creams or the waxes the harder ones that you may be using for the uppers are designated more as a shining agent and protective agent because there's more of the hard waxes like carnauba uh, in there there's of course the beeswax and the products that we use at least from saphir but those harder waxes will bring out more of the shine than any of the creams ever would as well as protect it a lot more as you can tell there's still a little bit there i have to get more of that toe wet kind of massages in there Again, I want to make sure that everything is wet proportionally so that it, when it dries overnight, it all ends up uh, being more even, in other words. So, all right, but here's the other one. You can tell there's a few little spots there from the laces. There was a little bit of darkening in certain areas, just a little bit might not be too visible. But uh, nylon brush, it's going to be your best friend if you've got anything with suede on it or completely suede. If this is not something you're wanting to do with the whole deeper clean like we are right now, take it to your local cobbler. They'll be able to take care of that for you, but at least for basic maintenance for yourself. Sorry, I might be making too much noise with the pump here, spray pump. But for basic maintenance, if you have anything suede, a nylon brush, very important to have um, because you're just going to be able to come home at the end of the day, grab your nylon brush and just kind of brush off your shoes. You don't really want to do that with the finished leather like I am right now, but again, we are getting this entire shoe wet right now uh, with the desalting solution that we have. And um, so I'm going to be brushing over that upper and we're going to be refinishing it anyways. But if you have any suede sections on your boots or shoes, or they're completely suede, that nylon brush is perfect for the suede, for the nap on it, because it's going to help bring back some of that nap is one thing. The other thing is good. it's going to take off a lot of dust, debris, or anything that may be kind of embedded within that suede. And you want to do that, you know, mainly because that dust starts to build up, that dust, the dirt, the grime, it builds up, it's gonna be dry, it'll come off easily. But if you end up wearing those shoes or boots out in a little bit of a worse weather condition, like snow or rain, that's when that dust and dirt actually turns into mud. And now you've got a thin layer of mud buildup on your suede shoes. So, you know, if you're gonna be getting suede, Please make sure to consider the fact that your, your suede, even though there aren't many care products that you can put on top of the suede to kind of nourish it or really do a deep clean, like say something that's solvent based that's designed for finished leather, at least doing that small little bit with the suede brush will extend that life expectancy significantly. So, you know, even if uh, even if it's a pair of shoes that you know you you ended up getting and you don't expect to wear them often or anything, grab your suede brush when you get home after a night out or whatever it may be, or even if it's a late night or whatever, you could do it the next day, but uh, try not to wear them after you've already worn them and haven't brushed them off. Again, you get into some bad weather, you're gonna have uh, you know, that dirt and grime turn into mud. It could get more costly on, on the cleaning afterwards if you bring them into, say, us or another cobbler shop. The cleaning can go up in price. The other thing is that sometimes it can't be restored back to original unfortunately it's it's the hard truth everything breaks down everything gets damaged and in some cases it could get damaged or broken down so badly that it just cannot be restored you know back to original it just can't 
dyes fade out, um, you know, certain staining can end up causing some kind of issues as well. You know, just brush it up every now and then. Waterproofer is definitely another thing you want to have. I always recommend having a waterproofer that is water-based for suede and nubucks. I never recommend anything with silicone or polymer. It's a little bit too strong. Um, you know, it may discolor it. You may have uh, watermarks left over after the polymer and silicones. Um, and the waterproofing agents so stick to something that's a bit lighter it might not be as strong so you'd have to reapply it every three to five months again depending how often you wear it but in the long run your suede's are going to be a lot safer and uh, better off that way but anyways um at this point i am done for today now these are all wet and everything heels are curing here i try to avoid and make sure get not get anything on the heel bases they won't get deactivated from this spray at all again there are no solvents in it it's a uh, vinegar desalting agent and uh, some easy cleaner as well so we're not going to have any kind of issues where i'm going to come in tomorrow morning and the heel base didn't adhere properly or anything like that i'm also waiting on uh putting in the nails to attach this right now i just want to make sure everything is cured because sometimes when you build a new heel block like this if the adhesives haven't cured because this is a leather to rubber binding that we're doing um, the pressure can somewhat deactivate small little spots that we don't notice and so in that case i'd much rather let it cure properly and then tomorrow i'll be able to do a lot more with it all right so i've got that taken care of now i'm going to go ahead and get going it's uh it's been a really long day it's extremely late here and I gotta go get some rest in before tomorrow's long day ahead of me. We'll see you later. All right, so we're back here again, and because I've been so backed up and kind of on a time crunch, I did have to skip over quite a bit of it. I've got the heel base on there. As you can tell, I got the edge dressing and everything taken care of and the varnishing top lift heel. I did nail down the heel base from the outside like they did originally. I kind of measured everything out and yeah, it's a lot better to actually nail that heel base from the outside like they had originally. I did use a different form of nail. I used a gripper nail, kind of like, oops, kind of like that right there. It's got little rings on there, so it's going to hold down a little bit tighter and better. Um, what they had on here were just longer straight nails, which aren't that great. I mean, the adhesive they used on it is fairly good, but gripper nails would definitely up that uh, strength and durability significantly so you know it's kind of a nice little upgrade for him there too this guy's getting a lot of great upgrades now but uh so we've got that sole taken care of i'll be buffing it up some more later on but at this point i've had uh the cleaner already kind of dry out as you can tell it didn't get everything at 100 percent of course you know it's the lacing areas they're they're cinched so tight that um, the fibers of the suede kind of get pressed down and we'll go through it afterwards with a nylon brush after we do this cleaning here on the finished leather and everything but unfortunately there's not much that can be done about that uh, discoloration there where the laces are you can scrub and scrub all you want you'll actually pull out the original dye pigment more than you will all that uh, darkening area there but anyways, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and go with our Reno mat here from Saphir and clean up the leather, the smooth leather section. Make sure you shake it well because it does separate there. And there was some, some form of wax or polish or something on these when I was uh, going through double checking everything. Um, of course, some of the little areas where the nicking was coming up a little more than usual. I had to make sure that was fixed up beforehand. But um, at this point, we're going to go ahead and clean everything off with the Reno mat and get it ready to continue on. Now, one of the reasons also I kind of had to skip over because this video would get much too long is because we're actually going to do a patina on the toe. So patina is basically making the toe and the back of the heel area a little bit darker so that it looks a little more two-toned. But regardless, beforehand, we have to make sure we get it all prepped and ready. And starting out with the Saphir Reno mat is a good idea because it's not strong enough where it's going to 
remove the original dye pigment, but it'll remove a lot of the old polish, some of the dirt and grime. And I've gone through and uh, blown off a lot of the dust and everything multiple times with a compressor and uh, brushed it off with a horsehair brush beforehand. And that's something if you're doing it yourself, you definitely want to make sure you're brushing it off. But I'm not showing you guys that because I already did that during the process of buffing up the edges here. Now the Saphir Reno mat, some really great stuff because it's pine based turpentine. So it's more of a natural cleaning agent, nothing too strong or harsh like um, acetone or alcohol would be or anything that has any of those solvents in there. That pine based turpentine is a little more delicate so you, know, you can definitely feel more confident using that. Still, I always recommend, you know, if you're doing it yourself um, and it's your first time ever working with a Reno mat on a certain pair of shoes, take, take a section on the boot or shoe, one that's not too visible, especially down right in here where the arch is, and just kind of test it out right there. See how it works, how it, if it's cleaning it or if it may, uh, may be doing a little bit of damage to it. So definitely always test out your products on that hidden area because it's not as visible. If your entire boot is a finished leather, you can always test it out on the inside here, um, somewhere where it's hidden away, like the tongue area. Some spots on that tend to work very well. And just uh, test it out beforehand before you accidentally make some form of mistake. Um, but I've got that one cleaned out. I'm gonna allow these to dry for a little bit uh, before we take our next step. Gonna go ahead and uh, go through this one with the Reno mat, and I'm gonna come back. I'll kind of show you guys real quick, since all that uh, suede cleaning solution I sprayed on on the top, I'm just gonna brush this off a little bit more. Definitely lightens up quicker and everything too. Probably tell side by side, oops. Just from dry brushing, there's no solution, there's no nothing on here, but this one's definitely darker than this one. So you can see that the nap is being brought back up significantly, just with the soft nylon brush. Just kinda go around back and forth. And this is the step right here that I recommend doing. You know, after you wear them. Now you don't have to get in there in every single nook and cranny like in the tongue area here or anything. We're just doing that because we've got the laces out anyways. But um, you know it's uh, just the areas that are on the outside mostly you want to go through and clean them off with just a nylon brush. It will help a lot in the long run. There we go. Alright, so what that one that one's pretty much dry. That turpentine tends to evaporate fairly quick. But I'll go ahead and take care of this other boot and I'll see you guys back here in just a little bit. Alright, so now we've let these uh, dry for just a little while longer and I finished out the other boot. Now I do want to mention uh, again because this is a solvent based cleaner. Please, please, please do not use it on any suede or nubuck, anything that's nappy, softer like that. Um, in some cases, it may be a little bit too harsh on certain exotic leathers too. So just please don't use this on absolutely everything you see. You should not be using anything with a solvent on certain types of leathers. Um, you know, no acetone, no thinners, no alcohol, no um, turpentines in it or anything like that. So. You know, if, uh, if you're new to this, there are a lot of great groups that you can uh, 
ask for advice about this um, on Facebook, especially. There's quite a few of them. There is Waxed and Dyed uh, group there. There's North American Shoe Rebuilders. Uh, there's uh, also Alan Edmund Enthusiast, Alden Enthusiast, Magnani Enthusiast. All those groups have avid, um, you know, shoe lovers and enthusiasts on there, uh, amateurs, professionals, there's cobblers on there who do this kind of stuff almost every day or, you know, it, even starting out too. And it's a, just a great group where you can ask for advice and everything. Or you could even ask your local cobbler if you purchase some Saphir products from them. Definitely find out details from them, um, you know, because there's a lot, lot more to caring for leather. So just kind of wanted to give that as a disclaimer. Again, also all the rest of the products I'll be using today, same rules apply. You can't use all these products on all your shoes and all your boots, you know, so definitely, um, definitely get a little bit of uh, information and details before you try to do too much uh, things yourself, because some things you might be doing wrong it might, might be irreversible. Uh, the damaging effects may be permanent, you know, especially with suede. If you start putting the wrong stuff on there, you could do some serious damage. But uh, anyways, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and move on to my Saphir Medal Dior Renovating Cream here. And this is the step you would end up taking if you are not needing to use the Reno Mat, if you're not needing to strip off any kind of old polishes or waxes using the Reno Mat. I recommend doing that maybe once every 6 to 12 months on average. Again, because it's a solvent, um, you shouldn't be using it too often. If you really want to clean more frequently, you could use something along the lines of a saddle soap as well. It's got uh, less to no solvents, in other words, in it. But you could always use the uh, Medal Dior Renovating Cream because it is water-based, so there's no solvents in it. It's got your main coil, lanolin, and a small amount of beeswax. So you could definitely use that to clean up the leather and um, as at the same time nourish it and treat it. And that's what we're after right now is the nourishing and treatment aspect. With that mink oil and lanolin, definitely restore that nutrients that the leather really, really needs. Anyways, I'll go ahead and finish out the rest of this boot off camera real quick. Allow the, every, well, it's pretty much done with this one, but I'll allow everything to really soak in nicely into the leather and uh, double check. Maybe might go through a second time on it, but it seems pretty nice because our next step will still nourish that leather a bit more and restore some more of that color. So we'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Right. Now we're going to go on to our Saphir Medal Dior Pomadier Cream, which has the color pigmented here. We've got two colors here of course we've got the dark brown number five and the number 10 cognac uh, so we're going to start out with our darker color usually you want to start out with the lighter color but because we're adding the patina i'm gonna start out with the darker one here first kind of work it all in there a little bit better Now this does have a turpentine as well in it to soften up the higher concentration of waxes. So as far as penetrating into the leather after the renovator, even with the waxes that's in the renovator, it's perfectly fine. Just takes a little bit more. You kind of have to scrub it a little bit in other words but we really want to make sure we nourish this leather beforehand with some of that mink oil and lanolin.
right, now I don't wanna make this too dark. I could use black technically on here, but I still wanna have at least a little bit of, a um, little bit more of the visibility that it's you know, somewhat of a pebbled grain. So at certain angles, it just looks, still looks nice. You know, it still has that uh, more leathery look to it. We're still gonna be, of course, applying some harder waxes to this anyways. And we'll do it all accordingly. But that kind of gives you guys an idea there. Of course, obviously, it's not shiny yet. I have to buff it up, but I'm going to allow it to dry for a little bit. Maybe apply a second coat and really rub it in and just kind of work at it. And I'll do the same thing with the heels. All right, I'm gonna let that one sit there for a little bit and dry. I'm gonna go through this one, do the same thing. Let both of them dry for a little bit, maybe apply a second coat to the first uh, boot there. See how it goes. Afterwards, um, if I'm happy with uh, how the patina is still, still turning out, then I'm gonna move on to that uh, cognac color, go through all that finished leather all around. Same exact process, just I'm not gonna be scrubbing nearly as hard and, um, you know, let it dry for a few minutes to allow those waxes to harden and uh, I'll meet you back over here to see how it's coming along. All right, so I'll see you in a little bit. All right, so I finally went through everything and it's a little bit darker now, as you can tell there. I did end up having to pull out what I like to call big guns and bring in an odd color that not everyone knows about, but a lot of the guys that do a lot of patina work, they actually know about using it. Navy blue. That's what I brought out, yes, navy blue for the toe and the heel counter there. Now, I didn't go straight to black because the black tends to have a little bit more of a stronger concentration of pigment, I guess you can say. So it ends up being a little bit harsher. I mean, it just getting into that more pebble type of grain, it just looks a lot harsher. Where navy blue, it's still they use black pigment in it, but it's diluted in such a way where it turns out to be navy. So you still get that kind of nice, uh, nicer look, I guess you can say, just final touch type of look to it. So that's one of those uh, little tricks. A lot of a lot of shoe shiners. Um, one of them, Jason Darnstar. Um, we've worked with him already. Giving him a shout out, shout out, check out his video. He does a lot of great shoe shine videos. He likes to use navy on black shoes as well. It gives it kind of that nice little, almost like a zing to it. In other words, when you're having a nice dinner or something and you just can't place your finger on it, but something gives it that nice little hint and you just don't know what it is. Well, with shoes, on using navy on a lot of things, it gives it that nice little hint. Even bringing out something like, uh, you know, mahogany which has more of a reddish tint on on a color you'd never expect to use it on um, as well as uh, using something like a maroon cordovan or something kind of brings out that kind of interesting finish to it well that explains a lot i'm actually out of my uh Medal dior pate deluxe wax and navy right now i just sold my last one uh yesterday i guess I know I had one at least, and I am out of stock in my own stash, turns out. But uh, kind of perfect time to kind of show you the difference. Now this here is the Beauty Cure line. Uh, this is kind of the blue label from Saphir's um, line. It's great stuff, still more of a premium product compared to a lot of other things out there on the market. But uh, the Medal Dior line right here on the same stuff, Pate Deluxe, is kind of a step up. Has a little more concentration of certain waxes, a little bit more pigment as well to it. And so it's it's just a nicer product for a few bucks more usually on average. Um, now, again, unfortunately, I'm out of the navy one. But since we're just doing a little bit with the patina work, in other words, we're going to use just a just a small amount and then touch it up with the Medal Dior stuff anyways. But right now I've got the navy one here. And we just like to use our fingers a little bit.
All right, let me set this one aside. So I've allowed these to dry for a little bit. Now, they're not completely all that dry enough yet, at least not by what I want to do. But I'm going to go ahead and grab one of these horsehair brushes that's shaped like a toothbrush, get my neutral cream, and just kind of go over the welt area here a little bit. Now again, we've uh, gone through multiple times and cleaned everything. Having one of these around to kind of clean up um, the welt before starting the whole cleaning and treating process definitely comes in handy. But since we've already cleaned up the welt, we're just going to apply a little bit of this neutral pate deluxe wax to the welt area gives it a bit more of a shine slightly as well as protects the laces for a longer period of time even though these lace not laces the stitching right where the welt is even though the stitching is a uh, nylon polymer blend it, uh, it it won't degrade not not as easily at least um, but Still a good little layer of protection, plus also it uh, just gives a nice little touch afterwards too. If I can get my arm and my watch there. Now I grab my dark brown. Man, that thing looks almost black. Touch up that toe a little bit. And the multiple layers there. Now we already varnished the edges of the soles here, of course. Applied a nice, uh, nice thick coat of a hard wax. But since we've been doing so much with the uppers, we're gonna take this and kind of touch it all up, all around. All right, so we're gonna allow everything to sit and dry. I'm gonna go ahead and take care of uh, the other one real quick, and then I'll be right back. All right, so I had to finish up a few things, glued up the insole back inside, the original one, put the laces back in and everything, and uh, did a little bit of waterproofing. We like to use the Four Seasons waterproofer because it's water-based, so there's no um, polymer or silicones in it, which is better for suede, um, doesn't discolor it or anything. Right now, these are still a little damp, they're drying, um, just because I sprayed them a little bit ago. But anyways, that's the that's the whole process it takes to resole a pair of Edward Greens with uh, day-night rubber soles, day-night heels, of course, replacing that heel base with a new leather one as well, and uh, doing a little bit of patina work on the toes there. Now we could go further back on the toe if we want to, but usually it's one of those things that's better to do gradually, start out at the further end basically like that and you know, over a period of time as you're building up wax and pigment, then you work your way back slowly. Um, so, yep, got all that there. Again, those nicks and scratches that are there. I wish there was a lot more that we could do. There was one like way down here. Tried gluing it up a little bit there. Um, not anything that I want to put too much dark patina or filler on it because it ends up being even more noticeable that way. Um, but oh, I almost forgot to show off that heel a little bit there. But yeah, those are the steps that we take, um, the process that it takes to resole everything. You know, as you can tell, used quite a few different uh, products from Saphir to take care of these uppers. Um, so there's there's a lot more to leather, different types of leathers and everything, the way it's treated as well. So we always ask that if you're new to this, you know, ask. Ask in a group, a forum, you know, certain pages on different websites, contact a cobbler, visit your local cobbler, ask questions you know unfortunately I understand there are some cobblers that um, might not uh, find things so detailed they just use 
same few products on just about all types of leathers, but not all leathers are the same. So just ask around, ask a few questions, you know, read up on it, uh, watch maybe a few videos like this one if you're watching as well. You get those, uh, get those details from all these different places and eventually you'll fine tune it and figure out what products you like, what products you don't like, um, which products you might not need, especially like I said, if you're going to a cobbler or a shoe shiner regularly with certain pairs of shoes, you may not need all the pigmented creams. You may just need the Renovator and the Pate Deluxe. Or if you don't go to a cobbler regularly and you're trying to stay on the more minimal side, at the base minimum renovator for your conditioning and somewhat of a shimmer and protection. Uh, secondary would be your pate deluxe to restore the color and apply more waxes. Definitely always number one thing. Any Anyone that owns shoes, well, everyone owns shoes. Anyone that owns nice shoes that are leather, even if they're a lower quality shoe, if they're still leather, horsehair brushes are a must. At a minimum, you have to have two always, one for your light, one for your dark colors. And that way you're able to kind of buff them up, spiff them up a little bit, clean off any dust or debris. Um, the other thing is, of course, cedar shoe trees are very important as well. These didn't have them in there, but I'm, I'm assuming this gentleman has them. He doesn't have much creasing right in this area here. So I very much believe that he has some shoe or boot trees for these. Definitely an investment that you have to make if you've got a nice pair of shoes that you plan to have for a very long time. I mean, these boots are designed to be resold plenty of times before finally giving out with proper care and maintenance. That leather upper is going to stay beautiful. It's going to evolve over a period of time. It's going to change. You're going to change it. Just admire it. Don't, don't try to force too much of anything. You know, again, we forced a patina on it. If you're doing it yourself, there are a few different methods of it, but you need a certain level of experience before you really take that leap and try to do your own version of patina. You know, a little bit of practice on maybe a cheaper pair of shoes, find out all the details that you need to know on what products and stuff, you know, so it's uh, so it doesn't end up being a mess. But anyways, uh, before I ramble on anymore, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. And uh, as always, don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you've liked this video and want to see more, hit that notification bell icon. Also, if uh, you're having any more detailed questions or if you want to come visit us as well, if you're local here, you could always stop by our shop. If, uh, if you're not local, you could always go to our website, cobblersplus.com. All of our contact information is there. If you're wanting us to work on a pair of shoes or boots and you need to ship them out to us, go to the uh, ship and order tab up top, follow the instructions and uh, send them on over to us and we'll be more than happy to take care of whatever you need done on your shoes, boots, belts, even jackets and purses. We do a lot of that kind of stuff as well. But uh, anyways, again, we'll see you guys all next time and gals too.